Grumpy Old Geeks. Two old farts, a microphone, and the internet. What could go wrong? Hello, Jason. Hello, Brian. Episode 21. Woohoo! Blackjack. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll let you, uh, let you take it because you were the one running a bit late today. Uh, you had a client call at the last minute. This time I was ready. Ha! Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it wasn't even a client call. It was just, you know, of course, the, the frantic emails that something's broken that wasn't my fault, like right before we start. So Yes. Well, I've been dealing with that as well. Uh, thanks a lot again, Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you say something you shouldn't have? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, just like Twitter breaking. You know, it, it's, uh, all, you know, you know what our life is like now as a developer. We use all these third-party tools and we use their APIs. And uh, once they change them and old things break, we have to deal with that. But the client doesn't understand that it's not us, it's them. So, Oh, how funny. Guess what my problem was with, the, with my client. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> third-party developer updated the Twitter functionality on their thing and it broke yeah yeah well <laughs> so. that's uh yeah trying to explain that to people that aren't uh, particularly tech savvy is always a pain in the ass and at the end of the day you know they don't really care they just want it fixed but it's really hard to explain like you know twitter drastically changed their api and I- i'm sure most people have noticed that twitter feeds all over the web have gone down and um they don't really allow you to do a lot of the stuff that you used to do so explaining to a client that you can't have it exactly the way that you used to have it and then they just go well why not and yeah. <laughs> so, so is this is this part of the uh, them pulling all of the like old functionality where you could do searches? Yeah, some of that, some of its design issues, some of it. You know, it's just the whole the new API is is pretty different. I mean, I was able to get around a lot of it using the OAuth stuff and and got most of the functionality back exactly the way it was. But it was a massive pain in the ass to do, and a lot of people haven't figured out how to do it yet. And the documentation out there is a bit spotty at best. So, but I was yeah. able to wade my way through and actually do a little bit of real coding this morning. So that was fun. Oh, good for you. Yeah, felt nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's just them requiring those re- requiring the API keys and the OAuth keys so they can throttle anybody and everybody. Exactly. And that, that idiotic uh, uh, what is it? What guidelines are those? The uh, the look and feel guidelines, basically, where it has to look like exactly like it would on the Twitter site. Yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna roll your own stream that's not a widget might have possibly ignored that part but that's okay um, yeah but to see now they can shut you off if they see it and they don't like it yeah, which is yeah. crazy crazy because it's still your own data you it's know? your own well yeah it's it's your own data but it's it's a free service well so. that it also depends on if you're like snarfing yeah. oh my god a spider just killed an ant outside the window cool. oh wait no an ant killed a spider that's impressive oh, ape has killed ape <laughs> Yeah, oh, anyway. yeah. The other the other issue is you know the throttling that they do now. So I actually had to write a, a caching system and then a cron job to pull the Twitter feed every fifteen minutes so we don't go over and things don't get shut down. Fun. Oh, you could have pulled some of that code I wrote for you a long time ago that had that. Oh, had does a, it still work with the with the new version? No, but you could uh, all the caching stuff and the database storage stuff was pretty cool. Right. Yeah. I guess I got to go back and rewrite that now. Yay! Yeah, you do. <laughs> Well, I, I would do it this weekend, but I'm moving this weekend. And yeah. after almost dying in a tractor accident this morning, um, it's going to be a great weekend. <laughs> you have an interesting life now. <laughs> I know. I know. I didn't realize that the, these old tractors, the brakes don't really work that well. And we have a very steep uh, yard. <laughs> and I had a trailer full of trees. <laughs> and it was, yeah. Fortunately, I didn't panic, but I almost <laughs> I almost uh, did a Sunny Bono <laughs> this morning. Wow. On a tractor. On a Sears tractor, that would that is not the way to go. That's <laughs> so not the way to go. Yeah. So uh, it, speaking, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, go well, hang on. No, the um, what I was going to mention before was like all this week in my my day to day, I had to deal with getting my hands dirty again in HTML and CSS and jQuery and all that stuff. Right. Man, the world is different. Oh, <laughs> it is. Yeah, coding is so different from what we did even five years ago now. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm I'm using this stuff as as a way to get my chops back up and doing it the right way. You know, like using sprite sheets and all that stuff for CSS rollovers and yeah. trying to trying to put as much into pure CSS and well formed code. Mm-hmm. And it's actually really fun. <laughs> I mean, I've it's it's a bit evil, like trying to figure <laughs> out how this all works on all the browsers because. You know, there's always IE, my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I haven't even looked at my stuff in IE yet, and I don't want to. <laughs> um, but doing like multiple floating pin divs that you know emulate like 
just all this crazy stuff and it's yeah it's it's fun actually to there's learn a, all the stuff or get up to speed there's a lot of cool stuff you can do now and, and it's a completely different way of coding but uh, you know i don't <laughs> i'm not a runner anyways but i i understand the concept of a runner's high i get it from coding sometimes i don't know if that happened to you this week where you're just you get so into it and you're like this is cool as shit and you're figuring out how to do stuff and, and it makes sense and it clicks in your brain and you just run with it it's great yeah, I, I mean, I know, I know that feeling intimately, <laughs> but no, basically, it's I can get about twenty minutes of uninterrupted time, then it's I have I get distractions here. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I miss that. I would love to have you know six <laughs> straight hours to sit down and just do CSS and JavaScript and you know yeah all this stuff, and then you know scream at WordPress for their <laughs> shoddy plugin support oh, and crap, crappy plugin writers. Yeah, WordPress I really is wish still I had the bane of my existence. Yeah, I wish I had a year to fork it and rewrite it. Yeah. And and come back to the world with like a properly done WordPress. <laughs> it's not just spitting bubblegum. It is such a mess. If you look under the hood at that thing. Oh, oh it's it's God. so MacGyvered, it's ridiculous. And and trying to make even the most basic changes sometimes and and some the way that some people write their themes and oh my god what a nightmare no that's the whole plugin thing where you just you give up you give up hope when you when you use a plugin yeah. and when you ha- when you're using like 20 of them oh geez i got a <laughs> client that's literally running 40 plugins at one time right and and, and they're running like a plugin to left a line or right align a date field it's like why do you need a plugin for that uh. <laughs> yeah there's yeah. definitely an over reliance on plugins for basic stuff because people don't know they use WordPress. They use the tool. They start off with the tool and they don't know the underlying mechanics of how things work. And yeah, when you don't have that underlying mechanical knowledge, then it's really hard to you know roll up your sleeves and do it yourself. Yeah, and I try to explain that to clients all the time when they just you know the automatic assumption is oh well we want something super easy let's do it in WordPress we don't want to spend a lot of money we want to be able to do things ourselves you're not going to be able to do things yourselves it's, yeah. it's you know once you go beyond the basic you know modifications of a theme and simple plugins you really got to you have to know even more than you do if you're just building a site by hand oh absolutely <laughs> yeah i mean with without the you know without the functionality of structured posts mm-hmm. I mean, there there are plugins to to make it into a structured post type of thing where you can have okay, you got four images on a page. These images go here. They're going to be this size. It automatically resize them. Text wraps this way. You know, without that, they have to know basic HTML. Yeah. And and after running Met blogs for eight years and trying to get the authors there to even understand <laughs> basic stuff, I, I mean, literally five times a week, I'd have to go in and and smack somebody's wrist because they were posting full res jpegs to the home page of the site like five of them so so the home page turns into like a 12 meg page load because they didn't they they like oh well i didn't know how to size it in an image tag i'm like it's called height and width <laughs> you can only explain it to you so many times but you can see where it says medium click media well, it's just and i wrote up these elaborate do- this elaborate documentation with screencasts and all this and, and without fail yeah you know well, I mean, that's that's the curse of of these of these free services that are out there that have you know Facebook, your Twitters, etc. Like clients don't realize how much money Facebook has put into com- making their structure so it was easy as possible for everybody to do an update. That is a you know billion dollar effort in programming and design, and that's why you can make a Facebook post, and most of the time you're not going to screw it up. That does not translate to the rest of the world out there. Well, that's why Facebook posts is a little bit of text in an image. It's really kind of hard to screw that up. I mean, if if I wanted to make all my clients have their updates with one one Im- with one either one link, one image, and some text, yeah, that's yeah, really no or a video. It's not that hard. Okay, yeah, that'd be pretty boring. Yeah, but. yeah, but it's just it's the mindset that people have now gotten into from using these things. They they go, well, of course I know how to do stuff. <laughs> yeah. So 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 somebody should just maybe that'll be my Kickstarter. I'll Kickstarter a year off. To rebuild WordPress. WordPress. And I'll go, WordPress I'll just go and, yeah, and I'll just go get a cabin, a cheap cabin in the woods, mm-hmm. and, and just a, a a monthly beer delivery. <laughs> they can just come up and fill the big tank, and now, I'll that, just sit there and, and rewrite WordPress from scratch. That is a Kickstarter that I would buy into, and I'm sure many other frustrated uh, people just like us would as well, because, man, I am so sick of using that damn program. <laughs> And, but it, it, it has to be somewhat compatible, you know, because, mm-hmm. I mean, you could just go write a new CMS. Anybody can go write a new CMS. But yeah, but you want to be able to. Take, take the WordPress code base and just fix it from the ground up. Yes. You know? That make would it be object-oriented. 
do not support crappy old languages and I mean that's they're they're in the the Windows realm now where they got so much to support. Yeah, exactly. It's like no, clear the slate. <laughs> oh man, so you got something about uh, some some clickiness that our that our friend the good doctor dug into. Actually, yeah, that was a uh, that was really kind of interesting. Um, Mr. Doctor David Teeter uh, got intrigued by the concept of the click track that we had talked about with uh, with our good friend Mike from the Google Dolls last week, who was a drummer. So we were mentioning that he had never heard of a click track. He went online, he did a little research, he found this cool little site with these that this guy has uh, music machinery. Uh, it'll be in the uh, in the notes in the <laughs> show notes. Um, where he basically created an online program that analyzes songs and basically a way to figure out if the drummer was using a click track or not when they recorded the song. And it's pretty cool. Um, It's a good read. He created a bunch of APIs, of course, because everybody creates APIs now. Um, They've run a ton of songs through. They've got a whole database now. It's pretty cool. Um, What I liked most about it was like version one of of the site and we'll put, or of his post, uh, we'll put both in the show, show notes. Um, he hadn't really figured... I mean, this guy looks like he's a musician, but he got thrown by the fact that you could actually create tempo maps when you're recording, which basically speed up and slow down click tracks. So he got a little thrown by that, and some of the songs were a little confused. But then through the comments, you had like other musicians and recording engineers commenting in on it and saying, well, you know, you can do this or that, so that'll shove your data this way. And he refined his, his uh, algorithms, and it's pretty damn cool. Neat. <laughs> yeah. Neat. Yeah, Very I definitely cool. want to check it out. I was talking to him on the phone about it the other day, and it sounded really interesting. Yeah, it, was a, it kept me up for uh, for a couple hours when he sent me that. I was going through it, and it was, it was a lot of fun. So, so uh, audio geeks, go at it. It's it's pretty cool. Cool beans, and uh, and and to go back to another guest, uh, Mister Shane Nickerson, mm-hmm. who who was. Uh, when we were talking about social media, you know, and, and how celebrities kind of fumble their way through it. And, you know, you haven't seen it that much anymore because pretty much everybody's been on. But now we have a new a new entrant into the arena. Yes, it made the news. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Prince. Mm-hmm. Our pal Prince. Yes. Yeah, he, you know, he's uh, figuring it out. But he posted uh, his obligatory food pick on number three. Yeah. Well, to be fair, he does what everybody else does. Here's what I'm eating. Yeah. So you can check him out. Uh, we'll put his link in the show notes if you really care. It, it, was, a, it was a toss salad, by the way. It was a toss salad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say if that's appropriate or not. But. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about this is actually, I mean, Prince back in the day was way ahead of the game online. He was one of the first uh, musicians that kind of created a pay fan club. He was, you know, when he was pissing around with the record labels and he was off them for a while, he was doing self-digital distribution via his website. I mean, way, way ahead of the game. And then, you know, he hops in on Twitter and just looks like a total noob from 10 years ago. So, I think we discussed this on the show. You know who did his first website, right? Mm-mm. Yours truly. Really? I wow. built the first print. I, I or the first Paisley Park website for his uh, for his whole shebang at Paisley Park, and Fantastic. it was the first client that I got fired by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. well, Prince is notorious for firing people left, right, and center. So, yeah, there you, well, that, go. you know what? You, this was this was actually from one of our shows that we never aired. Uh, we were talking about drinking and coding and and doing really stupid things, <laughs> and they were they were making really stupid mistakes, and I got really drunk one night. I mean, this is when I was twenty five, right? And uh, went to my AOL account and created a new alias and handle. And this was after the site went live. And I sent them scathing feedback about the website from this, you know, <laughs> non-existent AOL account that I just created. But I was at the office at the same time. And they were smart <laughs> enough to match IPs. Oh, <laughs> and, man. Oh, well. And, and they, fired, they fired us and didn't pay the bill. <laughs> so <laughs> don't drink in, in feedback. No, never. And, and definitely don't do it from the same location. <laughs> hey, man, you live and you learn. You, you live, live and, and learn. learn, yeah. Fortunately, I was doing that before most people knew what the internet was, so I learned early. <laughs> this was literally 95, 96. Hmm. Yeah. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So at least, you know, Prince is you know, trying to get back on the wagon some, <laughs> somewhat here. S- somewhat. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all I got on Prince. Me too. Welcome to This Week in Shit We Put on Our Computers. So, I got a new app this week that I've been trying out. Is this for your computer or your phone? This is for my phone. This is for the iPhone. Um, 
a while back you got me into using the Fitbit, which uh, at some point just kind of disappeared from existence. It's probably in some of my one backpack I have somewhere, or maybe on, in a suitcase. Uh, I went away, I stopped using it for a bit, and uh, then I saw, uh, I can't even remember where this popped up, an app called Moves for the iPhone. I think they're going to do an Android version soon, who knows? Um, who cares? Who cares? It basically, you know, does pretty much the same thing. Uh, it calculates, you know, as long as you keep your phone on you, it calculates the amount of steps that you take every day. Uh, you can plug in height, weight, age, and it kind of does rough calorie you know, calculations or whatnot. Uh, the thing I really like about it, because I bike a lot, is it actually differentiates between walking and biking. So for me, that's friggin' fantastic. So like yesterday, I biked 14.4 miles, and, but only walked 4,000 steps. So I'm able to track all of this stuff. Um, it, it, it also, you know, differentiates when you're in a car and it just says transport or whatever. Um, and they're supposedly going to be working on the app so it gets even finer delineations between what type of travel you're doing. I can't wait to take this thing on an airplane and see what happens. Um, it's a pretty cool app. I like it. It's a lot easier for me to use than Fitbit. You know, it doesn't have the tie into a website and, and calculate stuff and all that. But, uh, you know, as far as a simple thing just to track how much I bike and walk every day, absolutely fantastic. I'm loving it so far. Of course, it's completely free, too. And I haven't seen an ad yet, so who the hell knows how they're going to make any money. But there you go. Oh, that was, hey, that was going to be my first question. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, know how they're going to make money. I mean, I don't know if there's much you know, money to be made from, from getting all this information about how much people are walking and cycling. But right now, it's, it's a free app, and there's no ads. Yeah, I'm sure VC sponsored and all that good stuff. Um, I have actually used this app. It looks a little bit nicer now than when I used it. I used it a while ago, and I actually did fly with it. Okay. <laughs> and it got really confused. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that... Um, I had a problem with was mm. battery life just was abhorrent. I mean, I, I literally had half a day's battery when I used it. Right. Yeah, that seems to be better. I haven't noticed it being too bad yet, but I'll let you know uh, on the next podcast because this weekend I'm going to be like popping up to Santa Barbara and I'll be going out and about a lot without a charger around, so we'll see how fast it drains. I mean, they talk about it a lot on their fat, on their FAQ on their site about how they're trying to work with that and get it better and better and better, but so far... Can't complain. Yeah. I mean, and, and you've got a 5, I've got a 4S, and I tried it on a 4S. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem to uh, be doing too much drain. Yeah, so. The thing that really kind of that turns me off about it, there's no social, there's no real... Uh, did they build an export in the app yet where you can at least get like a CSV of your data? No, so you can no, have like a story. Okay, no, no, that's, that's, a, that's a deal killer. I need to be able to export and throw it in a spreadsheet so I can track over time. I'm, I'm surprised I'm a nerd. that they actually don't have that because, I mean, it does send all the data back to their servers where they do all the calculations and then push that back to you. So I'm sure it's just a matter of time before you're able to sign into your account on their site and do an export if they get that far again. Or even, gonna, in, yeah. even in iTunes, you know, like when you yeah. go to your app section in iTunes, be able to just pull down a CSV of the, the database or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, it looks like they've got, uh, you know, under the settings, they have... The, this thing called apps, which nothing is in there yet, but they're going to try to do like, you know, they should obviously try to like attach it to something like my fitness pal, which is one of the really popular kind of, you know, calorie versus expenditure apps that are out there. So hopefully they'll, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll grow. It'll yeah. grow. Yeah. It's pretty. I mean, I give them that. It's it, pretty. It is really pretty. And uh, again, like I said, just because I bike and Fitbit doesn't really take that into account. It's great for me. So the people who should buy this right now are Foursquare. They should buy these guys and integrate the two services. That's an extremely good idea. Well done, Jason. Oh, thank you. There's a free um, one for you, moves guys. <laughs> or Foursquare guys. Or this would Foursquare. Be, <laughs> this would be perfect for Foursquare because you, that way you'd at least be able to start marrying the activity data, the geolocation data. Because I always thought that Foursquare should be auto check in no matter where you're at. Yeah, yeah, that would totally make sense. And yeah, but this- in, if they could turn Foursquare into a fitness app as well as a social drinking partying app, then you've got your social that moves wouldn't have to do. Mm-hmm. And then on the Foursquare side, you've got the you know fitness side that they wouldn't have to do. I think it would be a pretty good marriage. It is a pretty good marriage, and I wouldn't mind you know and. An, you know, an ad popping up here and there when I'm biking saying like, you know, there's a bike shop five blocks away if you need to get a tune up and that kind of stuff. So that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it's free. So might as well check it out if you, it's if free. You're it's pretty. If you're a cycler, um, I think it's great. You know, you're going to want this more than any other app I've tried out so far that does kind of tracking on stuff. So, yeah. So I mean, mine this week is it's kind of, kind of a throwaway just because I, I, I installed it <laughs> after reading all of the uh, 
you know, the security stuff has been going down with email and Gmail and how Gmail is no longer you can you can just not expect privacy in Gmail period, which you know, you should have never yeah, that, it, it's it's amazing the outrage that that has gone, gone around about that because of it. Um, duh, of course, it's Gmail again. It's free. <laughs> uh, and why did you think there would be privacy? I mean, there's they're they're, they're serving well, no, no, ads, no. so. But that doesn't mean that it, it's a it's a totally different thing. Computers scraping the email, which was what they would always say in the beginning. Yeah, nobody's looking at your email. It's completely private, completely secure. We're just. Our algorithms go through, look for keywords, and give you ads. That's all it is. That's what they said from the get go. But that mm-hmm. was ten years ago, and yeah, you know things change over time. Yeah. So, but I got I got a uh, I, I'm a Mac guy. So, mm-hmm. and I use I actually use the Mail app. And then the funny thing is, all of my mail that runs through the Mail app is Gmail based. But I got a uh, great little package called GPG Tools, which is basically they're using you know. Um, was it new PGP type of thing? Right. Oh, open PGP, sorry. Okay. Um, it, but it's a really nice wrapper for open PGP that works with mail. So you can do like one-click email encryption straight in the app. It's really clean. You can do email signing. It's super fast to set up if you're using the mail app free because yeah. it's running on open PGP. Right. Um, but it's it, it, if you're interested in doing... Open PGP mail encryption and you own a Mac, perfect. There are there are a ton of uh, PC programs that have Open PGP mm-hmm. yeah. encryption as well, so you'll be able to you know commingle and, and <laughs> encrypt back and forth with your buddies. Um, yeah, I'm still just, stunningly it, using uh, Thunderbird for for my PC mail program, and, and it does have. There's a bunch of apps out there that tie in with that. So yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're interested in email encryption, you know. This is this is one of the great, great easy tools for the Mac. I'm sure there are other ones. I mean, I used to run. I used to pay a lot of money for PGP. Mm-hmm. I had PGP Desktop, uh, PGP Disk. I had the, basically the entire PGP suite, and they they kept screwing up and weren't ahead of the curve on OS X upgrades. Well, I was actually going to ask: Is this uh, are they going to be coming out with this for the iPhone Mail? I don't think they can. That's see, that's too bad. I mean, yeah. most of us now, you know, I'm always doing email on my phone. So, yeah, you'd have to have basically an app that was just running. That was like a a secure email app. Yeah, mm-hmm. which wouldn't. I mean, yeah. I mean, it gets tricky when you're just doing it from your phone. I don't. I don't actually do that much mail from my phone anymore. I try not to. Right. Well. I try not to do that much email anymore. Period. <laughs> Paring your life down always fun. Yeah, it's actually pretty nice. I deleted. Uh, all of my sent mail for the past 10 years yesterday. Completely deleted it or did you archive it first? I archived it yeah. and encrypted the archive and threw it on a backup disk. And yeah, that's the way to go. It. So if I ever need to go back for legal purposes... You've still got it. I've got it. Uh, but it's not, it's, not in G, it's not in Gmail anymore. I, I put, that's what I'm saying. I pulled it all out of Gmail. It's on some backup somewhere. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Once it... Once it's on the internet, it's not coming off. That's right. Although you'd be surprised, some of the some of the great blog posts I've written have written over the years. I try and go back and find archives of them somewhere. Right, they're nowhere to be found. Even the Wayback Machine and all those, nothing. Nope. Yeah, can't find them. Well, so there are some things that fall through the cracks. You can always write the NSA; they've got it. I think these were pre pre them getting real big, but. <laughs> We'll see. I'm sure they've got it on a floppy somewhere in, in the vault. <laughs> a five and a quarter? No, three and a half. Oh, yeah. Three okay. Yeah, moved on. They're the NSA, man. They, they at least got a... They had three and a half, ten years before we did. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's on one of those zip drives. Remember those? Oh, those zip drives, Psyquests. Mm-hmm. Psyquests were my first removable media drives. <laughs> I still... I think I still have them somewhere. I've got yeah. a zip drive sitting around somewhere. I can't believe it. And a, and a disc. I wonder if it still works. Probably not. It could be. I mean, I had I actually kept a, a Quadra 650 for probably seven or eight years just because I had a stack of zip disks that I wanted to one day go around and pull the stuff off. Right. So then, then I finally finally pulled everything off, and me and my buddies went out back with a sledgehammer and went all office space on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you going to do, man? It's a Quadra 650. It's not like it's good for anything. No, that's true. Yeah. Bust it and up. The, and there were beers involved, and it was fun. Yeah, yeah. usually is. Yeah, so that's what I got this week. Hopefully, something more exciting will come along next week. But um, <laughs> this was this was actually one of the easiest installs I've ever done for privacy and encryption software. It was like smooth. 
Yeah, I mean, it looks. I mean, it's a great site. They did nice design work, so that gives me a little bit of uh, hope for them. And it seems pretty straightforward. I might actually have to do this on my laptop. We'll see. Do you actually use your Mac now? Um, slowly transitioning. Good man, good man. Yeah, yeah. So we're working we'll on it. There. We'll get you there. It might take a couple more years. We'll see. Well, no, I'll be I'll be back in LA soon, and we'll we'll get you hooked up. All right. <laughs> Snort it. I'm kind of a gear nerd. I don't want to. I did, some people use the term gear queer, which is, <laughs> you know, I've got some gay friends and then they kind of tend to not like that term. So yeah, I'm going to gotcha. go with the, I'm going to go with gear nerd. Okay. So I found a really fun site this week. I was I was watching the uh, the random show, the Kevin Rose Tim Ferriss show, mm-hmm. and Tim threw this one out. And it's called Everyday Carry. Cool. This is Everyday Carry dot com. And it's basically people taking pictures of the crap they put in their pockets every day, <laughs> which this was a thing on Flickr a long time ago. It's like, what's in my bag yeah. type of thing. But almost everybody on this site is like, quote unquote, tactical. <laughs> They've got <laughs> knives and flashlights because I'm a flashlight nerd, too. I got my sure, my $250 Surefire that's in my bag that I carry with me. And, but these right. guys definitely like, take it to the next level. Yeah, I've been scanning through the site. It's pretty interesting. I mean, God, I'd be so boring. I don't carry that much stuff with me. And everybody does seem to have a knife. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, definitely. That's the fun part. <laughs> you got to figure out what knives are good. I've, I mean, I've got a uh, Ken Kershaw onion that I've carried with me for 10 years now, and that thing's still going strong. I'll put a link to that one in the show notes. If you like knives, it's a it's a um, assisted open, lasts forever, little serrated blade. And it's actually it's actually the knife that Tim Ferriss was carrying for a long time because I turned him on to it. Right. But he turned me onto the serrated version. I always kept it carried the straight blade. He, <laughs> he turned me onto the serrated, and he, that was a good call on his part. Yeah, this is a this is pretty interesting. It's just cool to see what other people consider to be so crucial that they carry around with them all day. So uh, we should actually take photos of our own stuff and, and throw that up on the site for when this goes live. I, I can definitely do that. I, I, I will do it as well. <laughs> Mine will be very boring. <laughs> mine, mine will be fairly what you expect that I would be carrying, <laughs> but um, yeah. And, and the problem with this site is, I have found probably at least ten things that I want to go buy. That it is making me look at it, a bunch of stuff. I, I, I like the, the fact that there's so many moleskins in there, so I'm not alone on that one. Very, yep. very pleased about that. Uh, but uh, other than that, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there is some stuff I, I should start carrying around with me. Yeah, it's. Uh, there, I don't know, man. It's just pricey. The stuff that these guys carry is like top notch, and I prefer for my everyday carry stuff to be cheap. Yeah, everyday carry stuff, it, except for my phone, is, is stuff that I'm not going to mind losing because I tend to lose it. I, it's my sunglasses rule. I will never spend more than fifteen dollars on a pair of sunglasses ever again in my life. Amen to that, brother. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah, okay, let's do that. Cool. Uh, that's a. We'll put. We'll throw it up on the website for this. Yeah, week. we'll have pictures of of the shit that we carry around. Now, is this just in pockets or like is? If I'm taking my little bag out to go do something, I think it. Well, I think this is every. It's an everyday carry. So just if you're taking your bag with you every day, then that counts. All right, fair enough. You know? cool. it's, it's it's basically I I consider it what I when I leave to go out for the night. That's right. what I take with me. Okay. You all know? right, we will do that and add that to the site. How exciting Ooh. for all of you to see what we carry. I bet there's <laughs> a lot of people that are going to like this site that listen to this show. <laughs> Actually, that's true. Um, I found a great site. Um, well, it, it's doing the social rounds. You know, everybody's already posting it already. But uh, this charming Charlie dot tumblr dot com, uh, which is just uh, it's peanuts cartoons, uh, and he's replaced the words with a uh, with lyrics from the Smiths, and it's just I, it tickles my fancy. I, See, I, uh, <laughs> the thing about this site, I mean, when I first saw it, and then you you sent me the link in for our little thing um, in Mammoth. Check them out, mammothhq.com. They're awesome. Um, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh, that's so maudlin and sad. And I didn't know that it was Smith's lyrics. <laughs> I read the whole damn thing without knowing it was Smith's lyrics. And by the end of it, I'm like, oh, my God, that is so fucking depressing. I just want to go slit my wrists. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I could see if you weren't aware of the fact that it was Smith's lyrics, it would be just be like, oh, my God. But the fact that it is, it's, it's just genius. I mean, this is like the ultimate mashup of culture. This is, this is what the Internet's all about. This is why we have an Internet. And uh, it just, I, I, it kills me. I, <laughs> there's only so many he could possibly do. I don't know if he's actually still producing new ones or not. Um, he kind of shouldn't because I think he hit just about every major lyric already and just spot on 
uh, comics that he used. I mean, he used some of the best stills, and it, it just fits perfectly. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's going to take 10 minutes of your life to scan through them all, pick your favorite, post it, and, uh, you know, then the internet will be on and done and move on. But uh, for this brief moment, this is my favorite thing on the internet. So I don't know if you remember remember this one, and this is, it totally reminded me of it. It was Garfield minus Garfield. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Yes, <laughs> basically, <laughs> John just looking. I mean, just the whole panel, all the all the Garfield comics, but without Garfield. So <laughs> there's just no context, and it's just John, and it is so unbelievably funny. I don't know. We got to see if that's still out there. If it is, we're going to try to find it and we'll put it in the show notes too. (laughs) Yeah. Like the first comic is just John sitting there with his arms crossed going, I've done things in my life that I regret. And then just two more panels of him staring at nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, digital on we, I know it's so great. So yeah, I got to put that in the notes too. Cause it's, it, as soon as I saw the, that, as soon as I saw the Charlie Brown thing, it totally reminded me of this. (laughs) Fun with comics, kids. Fun with comics and uh, and the Smiths. The, the Smiths are no fun. Hey, There's no, no fun. You know what? I, I've always been a big fan and believer in the fact that miserable music can make you happy. I enjoy the Smiths. They make me happy. I enjoy listening to really old, angry, depressed Cure. It doesn't bum me out. It makes me happy. But I'm weird. Yeah. You know, I listen to... Uh, a lot recently in the past 10 or so years i listened to a lot of that stuff and it doesn't make me happy okay well to One, each their own. a weird a weird thing that happened this week actually was i found a a a, a mix cd that i made <laughs> at 10 years ago right 10 15 years ago it was basically an mp3 cd with 27 songs that i had made for driving and i'm like oh it's a you know tunes for driving and i just put it in my car yesterday and i was driving around and it was some of the best old punk rock stuff that I haven't listened to since probably I made that disc. Right. Totally brought me back to my youth when I was happy. So I'm thinking maybe this type of music brings you back to your youth when you were happy. Oh, that's totally what it, well, I mean, not that I'm not happy now, but I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the time of your life. That's what you're remembering. Like if I were just to listen, if I had never heard heaven knows I'm miserable now by the Smiths and I just listened to it now, I'd be like, Oh my God, what a bummer. But it reminds me of, you know, being back in high school. Yeah, I mean, because you have you have that baggage of memories that goes goes along with it. But this stuff, you know, it's the same thing. I'm like, oh my god, my girlfriend was so hot when I had this song. You know, it's just like I remembered all the good stuff. <laughs> now, if it's just like, and I knew all the words, and it was, it was just this flood of memories and endorphins that came back. And so I'm thinking that even your depressing music links you to the happier times. Oh, of so, course it does. Of course it does. Yeah. Because that's that, hence me why, reading Charlie Brown on the Smiths and <laughs> and basically wanting to crawl in a bed and put a shotgun in my mouth by the end of the end of the strip. But you know something now, though, I mean, now that I know it's the Smiths though, I w- I went back and reread them and I laughed my ass off. Oh yeah, it's absolutely hilarious. But actually, I I just thought of something. You know, the Peanuts cartoons always kind of bum me out. Oh, they're miserable. They were never yeah. funny. I never laughed. I mean, I remember just. The, especially like the Christmas movies or the full length movies that they did, just oh, yeah. being heartbreakingly sad and kind of a bummer. Absolutely, and Charles Schultz was a dick. Did you ever see the documentary with him? <laughs> no, no, it's, oh it's been God. on my list of things to watch for a long time because I he think he's a fascinating asshole. guy. But yeah, apparently he was a raging dick, so. raging asshole. Yeah, definitely. So I think a lot of that probably came through. I think Lucy was probably his incarnation pulling the football away, right? <laughs> you know. But did you ever see that the one? beautiful peanuts cartoon was when they uh, mashed up the peanuts to bad brains <laughs> i haven't Have seen, seen that. that one no no okay that'll be in the show notes too it, it, this was going around last christmas i think because i think they took it from the christmas special and like mashed it up to a bad brain song <laughs> it was it was amazing and I, I really don't like the bad brains but they picked the one bad brain song that i really like <laughs> so that's awesome so I'm going to have to head down to a Knott's Berry Farm this weekend, go over to Camp Snoopy and throw a bunch of uh, Smith songs on my iPhone. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, but you got to take pictures and, and draw your own thought bubbles while you're there. <laughs> oh, good idea. Yeah, come on, mash that shit up, man. <laughs> Welcome, our guest. We're joined this week by Mr. Scott Beal from Laughing Squid. Hey, Scott. Hey, how's it going, guys? It's going great. We haven't talked in a long time. No, it's been ages. I know. Well, I mean, we were uh, we were kind of in the scene way back in the day, and then, we, like, I left San Francisco, and then as soon as I was coming back, you left, and 
like we haven't kind of run across each other in a long time. But uh, I'm glad that we could finally get back together and actually have a chat today. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I know you ba- primarily from Laughing Squid, uh, the the website and the hosting site, because all my friends were hosted on on your service. <laughs> and, um, but I think most people probably know you mainly as you know the primary tentacle, as it were. Yep. From Laughing Squid. Um, so can you just like basically tell us what you do and the people who might not know you and uh, just give us a quick rundown on who you are? Yeah, most people probably know the blog. It's a blog about art, culture, and technology uh, that I started, officially started formally in 2005, but I was kind of proto-blogging before that. And then prior to that, I've also been running this web hosting company since 98. It's, you know, smaller uh, customers, lots of blogs now, WordPress, a lot of WordPress. And uh, so those are the two sides of Laughing Squid. It's kind of unique that way. So the hosting company sort of underwrites the blog to some degree. Right. You know, we do have we do have advertising now, but it's not. It wouldn't be enough to run it. Uh, so it kind of works out that we don't have to do things based on page view decisions or anything like that. <laughs> nice. Okay, so so you actually don't. The Laughing Squid blog is not the primary like monetary concern mm. of the company no i mean maybe it'd be good someday because who knows how hosting it's funny that hosting still exists because there's so many free options but they're still limited of course uh you know the way you can do with a full a full hosting account right but, uh what you may not realize is that i have nine full-time employees working for laughing squid for the for the hosting company well, and the blog. So I oh, four, okay. I have four full-time bloggers and five on the hosting side. Wow, excellent. So, since I, last time I saw you, I probably only had a couple people just on hosting. Yeah, and you was, had, yeah, you had three, I believe. And, and it was just me doing every blog post. So I did the first you know, 11,000. So now I've got help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after 11,000 blog posts, it, it, you know, it's time to – you can step back and hand the reins over to somebody. But what you may – people don't realize – even though I don't have the byline on many posts at this point, I'm still, I'm still going through RSS and curating and all those various sources. And, you know, a lot of what's on the site is still things that I've kind of put together. But also uh, our bloggers will, will present stuff. And, and Rusty, uh, our managing editor, finds a lot of cool stuff too. So who gets the final say on what goes up on the site? I mean, it's still me. I basically – I mean, our bloggers will pitch me, as it were. You know, I mean, we have a whole – system we use for that internally and and kind of they find things and i mean it's almost it'd be very rare that i would say no unless it's something we've already posted or you know they, they you know we'll do what happens right i mean you know mm-hmm. things will resurface or like hi god we post that in 2007 here it comes back around because it got on a reddit or something like that <laughs> and, and we have to decide like do we post it again because there's thousands millions of people who haven't seen that first time around because they were, you know, ten or something, uh, you know, or whatever. But you know, yeah. So that I always but, find um, that that aspect is just fascinating. The way things that just keep popping oh. up cyclically. <laughs> always, yeah. And or sometimes it's an older post of ours that will come back through whatever it used to be stumble upon. Now it's other things that make it resurface. Um, but yeah, I still I still hold on to that that final say, and. You know, we have a masthead with more publishing-like titles of editor-in-chief and that sort of thing. Oh, that's cool. That's cool that you actually still have your have your hands in the whole thing. Oh yeah. Because um, one of the things when when I when I met you, I was running Metro blogging. Oh, right, I, right. I had my my writers out there doing our stuff for our different cities, and we were not that organized. <laughs> so <laughs> we eventually got to the point where we had to tell people like. Okay, before you post this, go read the damn site because they'd be posting something that somebody put like four posts ago that <laughs> had moved down and wasn't above the fold. And we're like, come God. on, come on, guys, <laughs> you can't nope. do some research. So, yeah, just, or search. We just every, all of our guys are trained to search, and everyone who submits, we say it on our submission form, and it's pretty good. People are fairly good about searching first, uh, you know, on the bog itself. Mm-hmm. Are you running that whole thing off WordPress? Yeah, yeah, it's WordPress. Mm-hmm. Word, we've been WordPress. Since, 2000, since we actually officially launched in 2005, because we all met Matt in San Francisco, and yep, I kind of <laughs> helped too, knowing the guy. You know, like he <laughs> came came to town, had a meetup, and that was, to me was like one of the first times that I'd met the person who makes the stuff I use. You know, now <laughs> it's like always right. It's almost like I don't want to use something if I don't know them practically. Um, 
And also, it, it came up recently. That's that was the during the uh, heyday of Technorati. That, that seems to come up a lot lately for some reason. <laughs> oh God, hey, who's who's bringing that up? <laughs> I don't know. But that's how I met you. Uh, actually, yeah. you know, I think I met you at Matt Mullenweg's apartment, and I'm like, how are all these people working at Technorati? Like everybody at that party. Yeah. Who are very different people, right? All worked at, at Technorati, and then all you know, went their separate ways. Yeah, yeah, that was the funny thing. I'm see, I met I met Matt online in a giant feud <laughs> when I when I I redesigned Chris Perillo's locker gnome site and I used tables. Right. right. Oh <laughs> and, god. And he he had this whole jihad against me. They're like, he got his 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 Mullenweg army to say, "We're never going to locker gnome again until you use CSS <laughs> to fix it." <laughs> and that was right when I was going on a vacation to go uh, snowboarding, and I had to cancel my thing. So I hated this kid. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> Who's this little punk from Texas telling me what I can write in? Funny. So the first day when I got to San Francisco to start at Technorati the next day, our friend MJ Kim right. was having a little a little get-together at a, at a club. And they're like, Matt got here. It was my first day in San Francisco, and it was Mullenweg's first day in San Francisco. And they're like, Matt's coming to the party. Either you be nice or you're out of here because Matt's cuter than you and we want him around more than we want you around. And that was the first night that I actually met Matt in person and we shook hands and we're like, okay, we're cool. We're all good. And then you've redesigned absolutely everything in tables again just to piss him off. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I miss tables. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's when in that whole Technorati crew was – that was, you know, it was Tontek and Kevin Marks and it's such a diverse crew because it wasn't uh, Derek there too and like um, yeah, Niall, Derek, uh, yeah. Well, Derek Powazik and I started the same day and we left the same day. <laughs> <laughs> Niall started a couple months after us. Niall Kennedy, right? Was, um, big Mister Writer guy now. Um, he started a, a couple months after and then almost got fired because of the there was a. a uh, what, what do you call a uh, a kerfuffle about some stuff he got drunk and posted, <laughs> and and instead of you know talking to everybody, he went straight to the New York Times, and so when he went to the New York Times, we're like, well, shit, we can't fire him now. He went to the New York Times, telling them <laughs> that oh, I screwed up and they're going to fire me, and it's like, well, shit, we got to cover our back now. <laughs> we can't fire him. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it's come up recently because of you know back then. Remember, it was Technorati 100 the list, and we were nowhere near it. Now we're actually on it. But I think it's because there's a lot of missing blogs on there, and I don't even know. It's surprising. It, 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 like, uh, do you know Pingdom, the monitoring service? Yeah, Pingdom? totally. So they they've been doing blog posts about top blogs using the, the Technorati 100 list as their place where they're sourcing, you know, what the biggest blogs are. Uh-huh. So that that's kind of how we it, we realize it was still around and. So hmm. we're we're. I mean, it's funny that we're finally on this list that no one cares about. But because uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Technorati is basically, from what I know with uh, my little insider scoop, uh, is is primarily an ad serving technology right. now. That they're you know ad, they're they're like the federated media type of thing. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. So hopefully they'll turn it into something because I got a ton of stock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Still yeah. around, at least. Didn't make any money, but I got a bunch of stock. They're calling right now. Yeah. Whose phone is that? I don't have a phone down here. <laughs> oh. The hotline. Oh. No, no, no. I, I have to apologize about this. My, <laughs> I'm in my, I, I literally am in my mother's basement in Pennsylvania, <laughs> and... And there is a phone down here that that it I can't find. I'll, I'll put I'll post a picture on the Grumpy Old Geek site of what I'm moving this weekend because this is our craft room, and there's ten thousand dollars worth of silk flowers sitting behind me, <laughs> and somewhere in there is a phone. So I apologize for that. <laughs> wow. Oh man, yeah those 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 old days at those parties were fun. It had to be probably the one five release or one. For release of WordPress that we met then. Yeah, if you go to Laughing Squid and type in Technorati and go all the way back, you'll see it's back when I was like a blog post would be me posting about a, an event. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's pretty funny to look at those because uh, there was one there was some kind of it was one of the very first things I went to that met you guys. It was at a bar or something. And it was some I don't know milestone of some sort. You know, I oh, curious. I can almost Wait. find it because Technorati is all going to be oh. No, it was... Uh, was it the Technorati Users Group? Something. Let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, because there was one that Niall Kennedy put together that got him the job, and you might have been at that one. <laughs> that was that was funny. Yeah. Oh, no. This is a good one. Technorati 1 billion links. Uh, I think it was... Uh, yep, it was an event. 
<laughs> so funny. <laughs> what Billy Lynx. Do you know the other thing I tell people about? It's like when I want to explain how ridiculous it was back then. Tag Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> And if you look on the, if you search Tag Tuesday, you'll find Tag Tuesday, which back then it was a big deal, right? Tagging. Oh my gosh, this is a big thing. Which is funny if you think of it, right? Because hashtags and everything else now, that's so ubiquitous. But that was, I think, Kevin Marks and uh, I forget, maybe Tontek. And- uh, well, it was it was Kevin, Tontek, Dave, and me and Derek. On, the, on we were Tag the, Tuesday? Well, we were the team that created the tags for Technorati. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were the guys that, it was, I think the, the main thing was Kevin Marks. Because we were dealing with Delicious a lot and Flickr, right. and uh, he came up with the blog tagging idea, and Tontag came up with a micro format, right. and I did a bunch of coding on it, and Derek made it pretty, and Dave paid us to do it. <laughs> so that was pretty much all of us on so the team is, that did it. So say, this is how riveting Laughing Squid was back then. So on June twentieth, two 2005, the new Technorati. That's a blog post. <laughs> and I guess it was because it was a website relaunch. So it yeah, kind of shows how incestuous things were. That that's what I would write about. Like, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that was that was the big party. Uh, that was I didn't work. I didn't have a day off for forty days up until that launch. Wow. And then oh, we I had, that. Yeah. yeah, I had I had literally had band aids on all my fingers, and they were bloody. <laughs> it was fun. That was that's how you worked back then. And I'm sure there are yeah. kids that still do that today. You know, because it, it was I mean it was startup land, and we were like in the startup world. Well, all these things, and I was. It, like now, I'm like the old guy telling the kids, you know, how it was back then. Especially when it's in San Francisco, it's even further removed. When I'm in New York, talking to a 22 year old founder about oh, yeah. this stuff, which they would just not know about. It, they, it, you know, because what, like uh, eight years ago, there's just no way, yeah. you know. Uh, and and then I I always try to bring up things like Super Happy Dev House, which was really important, which was mm-hmm. just like a not really a land party, but it was just one night where people got together and. You know, drink Mountain Dew and eat pizza and beer and stuff like that, and just worked on projects that weren't part of their normal day job. Uh, but what that led to was Bar Camp, which people have now completely forgotten about Bar Camp. I saw the picture the other day with uh, Ryan oh, right. King, Chris Messina, Tontek, and like the where they were getting the domain and all that. I was supposed to be at that. I remember I was supposed to be at that ritual roaster meeting but i was somewhere else and i didn't realize that was the seminal founding moment of- well, you're probably at foo camp mr high and mighty no no no, no. i was at bar camp but laughing squid was a sponsor um i remember we planned the whole thing on irc such so and mm-hmm. say something right there and uh <laughs> well remember irc was having its comeback during that time period you know yeah. as far as popularity and then yeah now it's again now it's back yeah, I, I remember literally being in a room with four people at Technorati, this tiny little conference room, and it was me, Tontek, Kevin Marks, and Derek Pawazek, and we were all literally nobody was saying a word, but we were chatting on IRC. <laughs> yep. It was it was the nerdiest, stupid. And then I just looked up. I'm like, guys, we're right here. Come well, on. <laughs> that, that 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 hasn't changed. Now everybody's just texting each other. So from the other room, that's still there. I yeah. did that with my wife today on <laughs> Skype chat. You know, we're like talking, and then finally I just walk in the other room. Like, you know, this would be easier if I just. <laughs> We just talk in person. <laughs> like, yeah, higher bandwidth with. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool that Chris Messina, like you know, we were talking about hashtags. It, he came up with a hashtag, and uh, you know, back then he was. Well, what was he doing back then? I can't even remember. Now he's you know Mister Big at Google. You know how I met him, and I. It, this is also a blog post. It's actually, actually, appreciate this blog post. It was, it was the thing I was talking about when Matt Mullenweg had the first WordPress meetup I went to. It was the very first thing I ever took. My 20D2, two, my first DSLR camera, it was a, I, I brought my 20D camera, and it was this WordPress meetup, and that's where I met Ohm Malik and Chris Messina and Glenda, mm-hmm. Tisa, and, and Chris was working on Spread Firefox at the time. Oh, that's remember? right, yeah. Yeah. I remember he did the, the big ad, I, I think it was New York Times, or whatever, I remember I contributed to it, and back then I was like, oh, Spread Firefox, yeah, you know, screw <laughs> Internet Explorer, because that, that was the alternative back then, and... And then, right, Chris, oh, I, was, I can't remember the sequence, but remember, it's like Flock and mm-hmm. all those things. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's such a, there's so many projects that everybody did, and so many people came out of it, just like, they're like the superstars that you talk about today. But you can see the origins of Hashtag back then, you can see his interest in those things, mm-hmm. and how later on, it made sense that he proposed this, uh, but it's it's just weird when I see hashtags on billboards and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> so hashtag. Remember AOL keywords? AOL couldn't pull it off as giant AOL back in the '90s, and now you know this sort of open concept succeeded. 
you know. Yeah, and it, it's crazy. Like my, I'm stuck here with my family, like I mentioned before, and they watch America's Got Talent, and they've got Nick Cannon on stage saying the name of the act, hashtag, like, <laughs> if, if you want to vote for this person, hashtag this and that. It's just like... <laughs> What? The, what? Where? Where do we live? This is like some weird yeah. William Gibson's like splinter <laughs> universe. It is because it's so. It looks so strange to like the average person. It doesn't, you know, why is there a pound symbol? It, like, doesn't look. You know what I mean? It's, it looks very, you know, code like or something. And so it's amazing that succeeded. You know. Yeah. Oh man! And there was a point where we were both going to all these parties. Like, since you had your DSLR, I had mine, and we were going to all these parties. And we finally got the bright idea to say, "I'm going to the party, so you shoot, <laughs> and then you're going to the party, so I can, sh- so right. we could, so we could trade off and eat. We could drink." <laughs> that was the whole point. Well, I was I call it like the flickers ar- flicker arms race because you know I was just shooting with my little compact cameras, and then I joined Flickr in 2005, and I'm like, "How are they getting these great photos?" I look at the XF data and like, oh, I see. So they're using a DSLR, and they'd come down enough in price that it was, you know, it made sense to kind of try that out. And and then I think people just kept trying to one up each other on, you know, okay, now let's get a really good lens, you know, or get a prime lens. And, <laughs> you know, I remember when I met Thomas Hawk, who's a fairly well, a well-known photographer. Uh, you know, I remember he was asking me like, how'd you get these like low light shots and stuff? And <laughs> Wait, this was before Thomas Hawk had a DSLR? No, he had one. I, I ran into him at a party. He wasn't, no one really knew him. I, I don't know what he was doing. He just got into photography and he was asking me about how I was getting some of these low light shots I had. Mm. And I, you know, and, and it was, I was telling him a lot of it had to do with the lenses. And so he, then he was buying a bunch of lenses. And of course, he went way beyond. Like, that's all he does. Like, that's what he's known for as a photographer. Um, that's right. We'd shoot the Dig Nation events oh God, yeah so yep. crazy so crazy yeah the first live dignation i remember that back out at the uh what's that park out at the end oh. of golden gate park yeah yeah it's uh i know you're talking about yeah like out beach, there. beach chalet yeah yeah when they first started doing that stuff God, yeah yeah and kevin oh, rose when he was a, a little kid and now he's Mr. <laughs> like superstar google guy and- google i know it's crazy and then i've run into prager and uh, mauricio you know they just they you know, he left Revision Three, and they started this thing, Distort. I don't mm-hmm. know, if you've seen, which is like focused on slow motion video, and that's really great. Yeah, I, 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 I can't get past Prager's beard. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he literally looks like a troll from Lord of the Rings with that beard. <laughs> oh, great. yeah, I saw the video of them shooting the mini cannon into the yeah. the ship. <laughs> it's so great though to see that, but, but it's funny because I'm always the guy trying to piece together history. At, to other people, like, oh, but these guys did this before and all that. And, and like, so after Technorati, the next company everybody worked at, we knew, was Dig. Like, Dig was the company, like, everybody at some point seemed to have worked at Dig, you know. Yep. Which is right, ironic right now because the Dig is back, that Betaworks bought Dig. And I know the guys in the Dig team, and then they also took over uh, doing a, a Google Reader replacement. So recently I went to a Dig party that was the launch of their Dig Reader google reader replacement wow <laughs> and i told him this is really weird to be in new york and, no, and nobody from the old days was there it was all new new york people in the tech scene wow and and i put like when i put it on um, foursquare other people like didn't some people still didn't realize that dig is actually back and doing stuff and <laughs> I, I get their email every morning now and it's got great stuff in it i gotta give good. it to them they do, and you know what? When we get on their front page, we do get traffic. It's not obviously it's not like the old days, but it's getting better. Like it does does send traffic. That's cool. Um, so you know the you know yeah. the BetaWorks guys. Yeah, I, BetaWorks. I love BetaWorks. There's so many there's so many projects you don't even know are BetaWorks projects or things that are associated with BetaWorks, like Bitly was part, or some of them kind of spin off or. Um, and then there's this there's some like stuff like trying to think like Branch and Medium and some of those things sort of have crossover into that. It gets kind of confusing because they also will be invest in things. But they just bought they bought Instapaper as well, yeah. right? Yeah, they bought Instapaper. So at that party, I met the guy who was taking over uh, the lead developer for Instapaper. Okay, so do, you, do, you, do you trust him? Is he good? Because I, uh, I cannot yeah. lose Instapaper. <laughs> I, he seemed like a cool guy, but I don't I don't know. Although <laughs> uh, I noticed they just launched a bunch of stuff, right? Didn't they just uh, Didn't they just do their first round of? Uh, Feature releases, didn't they? I think um, I haven't checked it. I know Marco Arment posted uh, a beta of what the new Instapaper website's going to be like, and it was gorgeous. They did a really yeah. good job with it. They've got some good designers over there. Yeah, right. no, it's it's great stuff. And and I was surprised how many people were on the Dig team. I felt like it was ten or twelve, like at this party. So it's like it's you know, I they're bringing in uh, was it 
news me and, and they have other things so dig and also dig reader are going to evolve beyond just that sort of thing it's going to try to pull more stuff in and um yeah because losing google reader was a huge blow for me you know on my daily workflow and yeah, uh, same here. We actually had a show about it, and I convinced Brian had never <laughs> Brian had never used an RSS reader, and I convinced him the 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 wonders of Google Reader, and he's like, "Thanks, they just closed." <laughs> yeah, that was, that was awesome. I had about a week of using it. It was cool. <laughs> I I did not I did not call that one because I thought feed burner. It's definitely feed burners next, and I know you know I've purposely don't even give out feed burner anymore, and waiting for it to go, and I, and I, they stopped development on it as far as I can tell. Yeah, but it's still up and running, which is you know good because I still use it. And it's going to be a pain to flip that over, but and that's probably why they didn't want to break. The difference is right; they turn off they're going to break websites versus, you know. Yeah, they're going to break a lot of the internet for that. And I was worried about reader going away too if we'd lose some people because, you know, there's a lot of blogs that update infrequently, or also people who source from us from there. But I haven't seen too much of an impact. It's not like it wasn't a huge change overnight or anything so mm-hmm. that's good yeah that's really good yeah and it, hopefully people like slowly migrated off like i tried feedly for a bit and all that stuff you know what i went back to net no. net newswire oh my god <laughs> I, <laughs> I, went, I went back to net newswire 3 because the Jeez. 4 version is terrible i went back to net newswire 3 what i know i'm like <laughs> it, it gives me gives me news that's all i want give me news <laughs> i used to use that until i went to reader and that, that was part of my whole like just let's go into the cloud browser based everything and um yeah, dig dig is almost there. It's still missing a couple of features for me, so I'm on Feedly, but I like the dig dig layout better. Yeah, yeah, it, have- I think they did a good job. I give those guys give those okay. guys props, but it's definitely weird seeing dig back and not being, you know, Owen and Kevin and all those guys. You know, because right. I like right when I met Kevin, <clears throat> he had been on Leo Laporte's Twit podcast hmm. and <laughs> said something really nice about Technorati. And this was actually at, at one of the WordPress meetups uh, somewhere in the Castro. We were just like, we left and we went down to Lucky 13 to have a beer. And then Kevin rolls in with a couple of his buddies. And I'm like, I went up and said, hey, dude, thanks for saying the nice things about Technorati on Twit. And he's like, oh, cool, thanks. And then we got to be friends. And we found out we lived a block away from each other. <laughs> wow. And ended up hanging out. That's how I, I got to be friends with him Like over the years. It's like all those weird little connections back then. Oh, it always happened. It's crazy. Yeah, you f- And you look back at the people you knew back then. It's almost like you're making stuff up that you would know all these people that have gone on to do these pretty big things. Well, you I know. mean, you look at Soma back then. Like my first day, my first day at Technorati, I go back. I'm, Tontech takes me out for a bagel. And this, this crazy-looking woman comes up, like manic, Asking Tontech questions on the on the side of the on the corner where we're waiting for the light to change, and she's like, "I can't find this. I can't find. Where, where am I going?" Tontech's like, "Go over there. Go around the corner," <laughs> and and she she scurries off, and he goes, "That was Heather Champ." Ah, and I'm funny. like, "Wow!" And who was back back in the day an A list photo blogger, and everybody right. knew her, and in that community, she was like you know top of the heap. Who then turned out to marry <laughs> uh, the other guy that was I was starting with? It was very weird how yeah. incestuous that startup community was because I don't think people realize how small it was. Right? No, it's cra- it was crazy. Yeah, I think mean, going back now, it's different, right? You don't, it's just so big, and now that all the backlash has been happening there every other day or something, you know? Yeah. Well, you can't even move back now. The the rent's so high. Yeah. Well, I I never stood like after the 90s I thought, okay, cool, like it's the internet. We can work from wherever. Everyone's going to make cool shit around the country, but then they all started coming back in the mid 2000s, which I know because it's VC and Google and that sort of thing, but I may be on this third wave finally that they can just do it from wherever, you know. I mean, New York, obviously New York's got its whole scene, but that's not any cheaper. Uh <laughs> no. Right. <laughs> But it is a little. I mean, there is. It is bigger in some ways. Like you can go out in Brooklyn and stuff like that, and, and be a little more affordable. And I like that. Like Kickstarter is so committed. You know, they are leaving Manhattan, to going to Brooklyn, and they bought a building, and they're just going to put their headquarters in their Greenpoint uh, building they bought, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> Don't know how I got into that, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that that, that uh, makes me want to ask you. I mean, how, what's the difference in the scenes from San Francisco to New York, like back then to now? Because you're obviously well, yeah. there now and, and seeing all the same kind of startup mentality. And is it is it a lot different or is it kind of history repeating itself? Well, some of it, yeah. But the thing, the cool thing about New York is that it will never be dominant. It's always kind of the underdog thing. 
and you can instantly escape it, right? Because it's New York. You can go do all this other stuff. Uh, but I've had experiences like sitting and like I was in um, – or is it flat iron? Just sitting out one of the outside things, and the guy next to me was having his big API conversation, you know, loudly. I'm like, oh, that's like, <laughs> that's just like the old days in San Francisco, and um, you know, um, it's it's definitely. I think it's repeating some of the stuff faster, where like there's more people coming and stuff, and then people who were doing stuff before aren't coming to things as much. Um, the difference is, I mean, Bloomberg has really been involved in things, and he comes to everything. And he, I mean, we didn't really have that in San Francisco. Like, you know, I think Gavin Newsom was acknowledged it, and I think Ed <laughs> Lee is a reactionary. You know, like he knows he has to pay attention to it, but it's not really his thing. Uh, but you know, Bloomberg brags about well, you know, that he had a startup and that he used to rack his own servers and all that stuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he would say that it's so funny. Of course. That's coming to an end, so we don't know who the next unknown person's going to be that if they're going to be involved with it. But uh, you know, there's um, New York City; uh, they have a um, chief digital officer, Rachel. She comes to stuff. Like, there's definitely it feels like there's more of a commitment, and that's impressive because it's a you know it's New York City. It's not like you know it seems like it would be way easier to do that in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like New York City would be like if it were Bay Area with that and uh um but you know that thing is great it's it like there's so many co-working spaces there's events every night so it's definitely there's a lot going on with it oh the other thing too that the startups are much more public facing right so it's fashion startups and other consumer type things that i always think of san francisco was a lot of companies making stuff for each other and then <laughs> figuring it out later like twitter is a great example like twitter is like what do we do with this? I don't know. Let's, let's play around with it. And it took Twitter a long time to kind of figure out what it would be out to the general public. And uh, I feel like a lot of things here are, from the beginning, much more consumer-facing, you know. Right. Because uh, all, all these headquarters are here. All these companies have headquarters. And I don't think, you know, at this time, you don't have to explain, uh, you know, oh, Twitter and Facebook are important. They get that. So I think they're ready, like, okay, how do we get out to the next level? Um and they're here. So it's not like, you know, I think that's a, a big advantage for companies here because a lot of those companies are here. Plus Europe, you've got the European stuff is closer, I think. But uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and definitely with New York, with most of the industries in New York, they're used to making physical things. And, yeah. and in San Francisco, basically what we did was all ethereal, ephemeral bits <laughs> stuff. That's true. that's true. You know, it's definitely. And, but I do remember, like, at the first Webby Awards, the mayor of San Francisco actually did show up <laughs> and uh, Willie, what was Probably his name? Willie Brown. Well, yeah, yeah Willie he's, Brown. He's Willie Brown. Yeah. Like he's not going to pass up an award ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a, but, there was an open bar. It was great. Well, you know, what's funny. Okay. Webby awards is great. Uh, I was just at a party last night, co-sponsored, co-hosted by the Webby awards. So, cause they had moved out here early two thousands and, uh, and, still have their event and they also work with internet week so that's funny we, we have an internet week here which is kind of funny because i guess every week is internet week in san francisco <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it is kind of it is interesting because it does focus things a bit for a week and people come from out of town to it you know and a little south by southwest like i guess you know because there's panels and talks and parties and stuff um but uh yeah, I forget how I got onto that. But uh, <laughs> the difference also here is that the tech parties are on rooftops in the summer, which is nice because there aren't really rooftop parties in San Francisco. Very few. You know, Very few, and the rooftops are so small that you can have like 12 people up there. Right. Here, it's summer is the rooftop season. And last night, it was uh, – I don't know if you know the Barbarian Group. Uh, they have this beautiful rooftop, and they, they'll, they'll co-host with a different – company each month they call it the party's called roofies which is funny. hashtag, <laughs> hashtag right, of course yeah. yeah 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 and last night was webby awards and then the previous one was the onion so that's a cool you know like, oh yeah right <laughs> but it's funny cause so sometimes you see crossovers like that where it's like people who are not known as a tech company but are doing some tech stuff for the digital they have a digital side uh, and yeah. so that's kind of cool. All I'm doing is listening and getting massively jealous. I've been based out of Los Angeles pretty much my entire career. Ah, and it's like, we have right. a lot of tech here. We're getting more yeah. and more every day. Like Venice Beach is becoming Silicon <laughs> Beach. But we don't have this kind of engagement or crossovers or parties like you guys have in San Fran and New York. It just doesn't happen here. And if they do, and if they're across town, you're not going to go to them, right? Exactly. It's too damn far <laughs> away. <laughs> and, and think of that. So that's where you get spoiled too, right? It's like no driving, really. Yeah. Someone- I was driving. We got 
public transportation running all night. We have, you know, <laughs> even cabs are decent. Uber now, Uber and Halo are in town, and that's another good option. You know, like last night, just walk back from it. You know, like it's kind of nice not – because San Francisco was – there's always that thing to do. If you drove, then you're going to drink and drive, or you have to park, which is like that whole thing. <laughs> You know, so I I think that the infrastructure of New York City really helps. I think sub, sort of support this kind of you know. I, I think of like like Foursquare. You know, it's like it was a great city for them because they're out using the product, going to these bars and going out to the team to dinner and stuff like that. And so I also have my own little, other little theory about it being a, a good place for sort of developers and stuff is because you don't have these artificial constraints that you do, and especially in San Francisco, where you could work late as a company, and then you could still go out to eat. Like it could be ten o'clock. Amazing, yeah. you could still eat, and then you could go to bars. And you don't, they're not like kicking you out at one thirty and turning the lights on. And so you could do that, and then you could actually come in later. And it's like you can kind of shift around because uh, I know some startups that do that, where maybe they don't come in around until noon, but they go late, and that's just the way it works for them on their development cycle. Um, San Francisco is for me it was always about hitting these arbitrary constraints. And that's not just San Francisco. I guess a lot of cities are that way. With well, anybody with a two o'clock bar, you know, bar close time, <laughs> yeah, which is most of the U.S. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, but L.A. Like I, there are at least twenty four. Like swingers, I'm telling the swingers, like yes, I can go to a place and get <laughs> food late, or or um, uh, canters or any place like that. Like San Francisco has so few of those, and it's amazing. Like why don't they have more? Because there's there's definitely people who would go to them. You know. Probably just city ordinance. They probably not because everybody's so packed onto each other. You can't have a business that's running twenty four hours when you have you know the old Ukrainian lady and, living upstairs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. that was always a mystery. But uh, yeah, so New York's really good for that, obviously. And um, I don't know. Yeah, it's because a couple of years ago when I moved, to, I moved here three years ago. It felt like I, I felt like it was like maybe. 2006 San Francisco or something like that. Wow. But yeah, I think I, now it's, I mean, it's definitely more of its own thing. And there's a lot of people going back and forth, right? So I have some friends that have moved to San Francisco or a lot of them because of Facebook. But then we've had a bunch of people from San Francisco move here, like Aubrey, you know, Aubrey, right? Of course. Yep. Uh, yep. And, and a bunch of people like that have moved here and, um, and some now going to other cities. So I think, I think it's good. There's a lot of flow. Like a lot of people I know grew up in New York. They want to go live somewhere else, which I think is awesome. Like, yes, go, you know, try out another place, you know, and um, yeah. But and it's also because oh, people also come here all the time too. So I end up, oh, like people I miss from San Francisco, a lot of them come through here. So it's uh, you kind of see everybody. That's cool. Yeah, and I think the other one is uh, between San Francisco, New York. I think Austin's the next big one. Austin and Portland. I, 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 Portland's great. I think um, like there's a pretty good tech community there. Uh, even Boulder. I always put Austin, yeah, too much, and Boulder. Too, much, too many hippies in pot and Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is me. This is okay. This is me coming from San Francisco saying there's too much hippies in pot in Boulder. Uh, so <laughs> so. Probably, well, Portland would probably be. I don't know. It's quite hippies, but uh, yeah. Well, uh, Portland is hipsters. Yeah, it's yeah, gonna, the Portlandia kind of thing. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of mustaches on the apps. So that's true. <laughs> yeah, uh, I. I, I Austin has barbecue, so I'm, I'm digging Austin because they got barbecue, they got good weather, somewhat. You got South but, by Southwest rolling and, through. Yeah, it's a good. Well, time. Th- that's when you that's when you Airbnb your place and leave town and go hang <laughs> right. out somewhere else. Oh, it's really bad. I mean, every year I keep trying to quit, but I still have been going to it for some <laughs> reason. Uh, I only went one year. I went the year that we were doing JPEG Magazine. Wow! And uh, I got a tattoo, and I. <laughs> On the this was the this was the year that it was I think the second year that Twitter was big, but like literally in front of me was the adaptive path crew, and this was the annoying part. Jeffrey Veen was sitting in front of me, and he put his briefcase under the seat into my seat because he's so damn tall. Uh-huh. <laughs> but we had we literally had the executive team of Twitter, Adaptive Path, um, oh god I can't remember basically every major startup that was going on that year in right. two thousand nine. 2009, 2008. I can't remember which year, but uh, we all we were like looking around at each other, going, "Holy shit! If this plane goes, yeah. San Francisco's lost. <laughs> we're done." <laughs> True. <laughs> it was it was literally like the last plane out of San Francisco, and we were all working, and we're just like, "Let's get off." <laughs> that's amazing. And that was the only year I went. Wow. That's, yeah. yeah. I've been going since 2005, but uh, yeah, I think I think it's probably time to stop <laughs> at some point here. <laughs> but you quit Burning Man. 
Yeah, so I've gone officially now south by longer than Burning Man. Burning Man was hard because Burning Man's like, oh, if I just go, I went, uh, I went eight years. I was like, oh, I should make it to ten, you know, nice even ten, but. But it's a lot more work, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah not as ex- I guess it's not as expensive because South by all the official hotels are already sold out, and and you have to every other hotel you, that you any other one that has availability you have to prepay. Like there's and that's a pretty serious commitment. Yeah, you yeah. Know, You're three right. three to five thousand dollars or whatever it ends up being. That's just a lot. But uh, yeah, Burning Man. Yeah, I don't know. People still go. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I know a ton of people that are. I just they're showing all their their photos now, and I'm just like, I, I one of the things I could never do. I could never do it. I, I you wanted never to. Go, ever? No, I wanted to. Oh. I wanted to, but oh, I wow. never got. By the time that I was ready to go, and after I'd been in San Francisco and everybody was going, I fell in love with the street parking for that <laughs> the burning man to, I'm like I can park anywhere yeah. I can park anywhere and then it everybody that would come back were like oh it's dead it's dead it's like the same people coming back from south by you know yeah before but- it was even dead it, it's sure. still not dead it's it's thriving and it's going and they're just like oh it's not the same it's not the same yeah, but my, it's like my, my favorite band sold out <laughs> yeah but my first year at burning man was 95 and I got there they're like oh this thing sucks I'm never coming back I swear like I'm like yeah. what did I miss cuz it only been <laughs> It had been out there five years at that point, and it, it had doubled to like it was two thousand people to four thousand. I went when it was four thousand people, and they're just like, <laughs> "Yep, too big. We're not coming back." And, it, and that's they didn't even have a fence around it yet back then. So I, you know, I think it's still it's the kind of thing because someday it will not be there, and you're like, ah, "I should have gone." Yeah, but, yeah. I'm I'm still kind of bummed that um. Well, I'm stuck here in Pennsylvania right now, so I can't go this year. Obviously, it's right, still right, but. Yeah, I, I would dig it. I well, you know, so the same thing. It's like okay, these things start, they get big, they kind of fizzle out. Then somebody else starts a new one. So right. what's going to be the next Burning Man? Ah, that's a tough one because it, it's such a unique set of circumstances, environment that came together. Because it's the desert, it's fireproof, right? You know, uh, I don't know. It, we thought of this like where else could it happen? It, it may be like Australia or some other places that are pretty open minded that have deserts if you're doing that kind of event still yeah but it also comes down to like the mindset of the people of the time that start the event you know and, it's like and, and what proximity what's, to, to bay area i think is pretty important you yeah know? definitely right that's why there was no east coast burning man i think you just have that because you know and it was a lot of crossover with tech scenes from back then i mean google a lot of, i think larry and sergey still go so there's all those that crossover uh you know and things back with Burning Man, I remember in Wired Magazine started kind of the same time, then, you know, close to the same time as far as the desert part of it. And um, and then plus then all the pre existing history of the hippies and the beats and all that and the merry pranksters, like all that stuff. I think it was just sort of a culmination of that, you know. Um, I mean, Cacophony Society is the crossover that I came mm-hmm. through, you know. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I don't know if you've seen, there's a book out uh, about the Cacophony Society. It's. Um, this is my business partner, John Walls, was part of the early days of the cacophony, and I came in later. And um, I don't know how I got to that. No, oh, I, I, I was actually going to bring that up. I did see the book. I, I wanted to order it on Kindle, but you have to get the hardcover right now. It's so. kind of worth it, though. I mean, I, I get it because I read all ebooks and stuff, too, but it's, it's a big book, and it's, and it's got these great illustrations. I'm, I'm in it a few times. Like, it's funny. There's like an email printout of mine in the book because there's a. <laughs> Back when other cities wanted to start up their Cacophony Lodge chapter, and back then I was giving them subdomains uh, through Laughing Squid. So if they, you know, they wanted a, a Cacophony website, you know, we give them web space. And uh, um, then I don't know if you know, there's a Chuck Palnick connection. Uh, Fight Club is loosely based on the Cacophony site, or the Project Mayhem from Fight Club. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That would I I didn't realize that until I was reading about the book, and I'm like, holy shit, that is fucking cool. <laughs> well, he was hanging out with Portland Cacophony, and so we we organized these SantaCon events, you know, where you get all the mm-hmm. Santas, and we took it to Port. After we got kicked out of San Francisco, the second year, we took it to Portland, and we were we were going to one of the stops on the you know itinerary, and this guy shows up with a little notepad, and I'm like, you know, I always talk to those guys, and he was writing for Harper's, and it was Chuck Polnick who. Uh, was unknown at the time. You know, Fight Club, the book had not come out, but he was hanging out with those guys and considers himself a member of Portland Cacophony. And so, um, yeah, now he's uh, he wrote the forward for the book, and he's doing a Commonwealth Club thing that just got announced with the Cacophony guys, the authors, uh, at the Castro Theater, actually. Mm. 
So, yeah. So that's no. the crazy thing. It's like, I know we're going a bit long here, but it's just like, I want to, I want to just say that it's like, you look at the people in the time and like just all the crazy stuff that came out of it. It's like, and you look at the startup scene and in, in San Francisco and New York and all that stuff. Now it's like completely different. Everybody's worried about business. Back then it was more about art, fun and craziness. Right. And well, it's like, it. how yeah. are these things going to, how are you going to get cool shit like this coming out of that type of environment where everybody's just like, I got to work, I got to buy pizza, I got to drink Mountain <laughs> Dew, and I got to I gotta ship my app. It's like, no, back then it was just like, like with Technorati even, we're just like, let's have some fun, let's make some search and or whatever. We're No, actually, that's how I would describe San Francisco, especially with the art scene, is that people were there to do their art. It wasn't about being discovered. That's where you went to New York or L.A., right? Whatever your thing that you work on. You know, and that's why we, even like San Francisco would lose – filmmakers to LA and you know or whatever like it, people who stayed there were staying there not because it wasn't for the money it was like so they can just do it and kind of weird shit they wanted to do so I think that's another thing that gave birth to it you know right to things like Burning yeah. Man and all that and open source I think of open source kind of overlapping with that even the, uh, you know I used to say the SantaCon event is sort of open source because there's no one controls it there's just this model for it and it keeps evolving and mutating and I guess now it's really annoying to people, basically. <laughs> it is. They hate They hate it here. Like, it, it, the fact that I was an early organizer of it, I was not, would not be a bragging point because it's a totally different event here. In so, New York? They, they, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. They hate it. It, it. It's weird because, I, like, friends who are, like, in a tech scene who don't go to because it's kind of after their time or before their time, and I hear them talking about, like, it's, it, it, it's bad. It's so bad. And they take over, and it's kind of the sort of bro scene, you know, and just more of a bar hop. And it wasn't that way originally. And originally, too, it was like this convergence of all the different cacophony chapters would pick one city to go to, and, you know, we try to do unique things in that city. Uh, and uh, so we did Portland, L.A., and then New York, and that was the last one I did was New York. In 98, but it was in 98, so, you know. Things have changed. Mm. Still going. Anyway. <laughs> oh man. Well, it was great talking to you on the on all this old stuff. I'm just <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling very nostalgic. We've definitely gone <laughs> yeah. gone a bit long on this, but I could probably talk to you about it for another five hours. Yeah, but. that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So um before you jump onto the next stuff, are you cool to stick around for a bit or you gotta run? Yeah, hang out. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Well then uh Brian, uh take us out we'll pop into something new in a second. We'll do. It's time in the balls. This isn't a Kickstarter, but I did stumble across this this week. Mars One is a crowdsourcing, basically sending people to Mars. This yeah, this has been going for a while now, since <laughs> since May, I think. Yeah, it's been running for a little while. Um, this is one of those times where I think I want a government involved, or at least a gazillionaire. I am not putting on a spacesuit that's crowdfunded. Well, no, they're not crowdfunding the money to go to Mars. They're crowdfunding people. They, they basically they said we need people that want to go to Mars. Sign up, fill out our application, and if you are accepted, you can be one of the people for a one-way trip to Mars. No, they're also taking money though. I did see that part. They're they're doing both. They're crowdsourcing both the people and the money for it, and they're taking Bitcoin don- donations, which is you know very cyber of them. That's good. I, I do, and I also think Patrick Stewart did the voiceover on one of their ads. They played it on CNN this morning. That, that's one of the things that, that struck me. You, you sent this to me a couple of days ago, and I was looking yeah. at it, and I'm like, I, I recognize this. It's like, okay, these people I, are they Canadian? I believe. Or were, um, I think they're all over the place. But yeah. They, yeah, they are looking for people who will basically volunteer mm-hmm. on a one way trip to Mars. One way. To start a colony. Yes. And it's called One Way Astronaut. <laughs> Would either of you guys sign up for a one way? <laughs> no. So it's a separate, different, separate campaign to get you back? Is that, or do you have to do the campaign <laughs> on Mars? Is it a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, is. this. I can't even imagine people would do this, but I, I'm, I'm sure there are some. Well, they're calling it for. A, they, what they're saying is it's for a permanent human establishment. Oh, I see. So. Yeah human settlement but that's like um <laughs> have to build the settlement too because it's not already there so you have to get there and then build it this is like burning man extreme this is well like, yeah we were just talking about where the next yeah. burning man is uh, i think we got it, it we found it it's on mars <laughs> yeah. except nothing burns on mars because there's no oxygen <laughs> but imagine how good the costumes would be oh mm. my god <laughs> 
Oh man. But what does Buzz Aldrin have to think about? He's he's the big Mars guy lately, right? Isn't he been in the push? That's his thing, right? Yeah, I don't know what his take on this is. I bet it, I don't know. We should call yeah, him. That is interesting. I mean, I'm sure he's he's kind of probably coming along the same lines of me as, and like maybe the government should be doing this one. But uh, you know, right. there, there's no government space agency. That's anymore. true. That's true. Okay. We've kind NASA, of NASA just we've killed out of Kepler. NASA. They're yeah. not, they're, no, they're not <laughs> fixing. We've got the Kepler observatory up there. NASA has just pulled out today. They're saying they're not going to fix Kepler because there's no money. So, uh, so you have a choice between what Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, or Richard <laughs> Branson. Which oh. which of the three do you want? Well, or no, there's another one. There's another one. There, uh, what's I'll, his name? The guy from Quake. Um, John Carmack. Don't forget John Carmack. Okay. I'm going with Branson because, you know, Virgin Atlantic is rules. So at least the flight would be flies decent. People around. Right. Yeah. He's already. Yeah. Yep. Yep. He's got that stuff down. So. <laughs> well, I did. And I went out with uh, our good friend, uh, Shenny Jardin, to uh, see one of those ships fly. And those things are no joke. They fly. So <laughs> I will yeah. go with Branson any day of the week. <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> But he's not going to Mars. He's just going up to go have M and M's and roll around and <laughs> take money. But uh, wow. these guys are these guys are literally trying to get to Mars by 2023. It's extremely ambitious, um, and I'm just a little freaked out by it. So, <laughs> so you would well, you have a wife. You're you both have wives, so you have families, and would not you know obviously. Uh, volunteer for this, but apparently over a hundred thousand people at this point have signed up to say I will go. Really? Yeah. That- As of this morning on CNN, there were over a hundred thousand people oh. who have filled out applications to be one of the people that goes on this trip. Hmm. That that's shocking. I mean, hmm. well, I think there's always a big drop off between people who fill out the application versus okay, we're going to send you what? <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's look into the safety on this now really quick. Uh, we're not coming back? You forgot the, what? So I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm know. pretty sure the fact that it says one-way astronaut in the application, I think they know what they're signing up for. I think they're just... They, oh, you enough. overestimate people go. again, Jason. <laughs> what? <laughs> you overestimate people. It doesn't matter what you actually put on the web page. Nobody's going to read it. Oh, that's right. People don't read it. <laughs> Yes, Jason the Optimist. Uh-huh. That's not how I remember. <laughs> <laughs> First time he's ever been described that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, so my reputation proceeds, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> so they're not going to have any kind of stasis or anything yet because that's not really been. No. It's not that far. It's not that long. I guess it's not. Just, I guess I'm thinking of yeah. other sci fi. Yeah. yeah. But wait, how long does it take? Because they're always doing these simulations, right? Where they're. I mean, it's, is it. Six months or how long is it? No, a, I, th- I think it's close to a year. Let me let me. Is it let me, a year? Okay. Yeah, it was. But I mean, it's definitely right, not. It's not like right. It's not like Planet of the Apes kind of thing. Where <laughs> no, no. <laughs> 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 oh no, that definitely not not. Uh, you I just remember that scene because there's like oh three of three of the four made it, and then up oh, there's a skeleton. Oh well. Yeah, it was definitely the first one. <laughs> uh, support, you know. Yeah, I guess Ooh, they're they're taking two rovers, so you, you got a go kart track on Mars. <laughs> yeah, it's something to do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not saying how long it's going to take, but it's, I think everything it's just has to long. start. Like, I think everyone's just like, let's just start these things, and eventually it'll be a reality. Yeah, well, I right. think this this one, from what I remember reading about it before, because it's been a while since I read about it, but th- this 2023 date is because of the launch windows in the proximities of the planet, right. and yeah. it, it's the cheapest to get somebody there. I, mm. So they're probably going to launch in 20. 20- 22 right i'm guessing i like that in the fact they have an entry called what's the historic success rate of missions to mars <laughs> historically missions to mars have had a low success rate of around 50 oh. percent. sign me up <laughs> and those were for those were for machines <laughs> there was no meat that had to like get up and walk around on those yeah and i mean are they planning to send like shipments of food or are they supposed to are you supposed to be completely self-sufficient once you get there? this just sounds like a nightmare <laughs> or a sci-fi yeah. movie no, these. This is this is just corpse in space. Yes, That's all it is. there you go. So, but you you were mentioning uh, Planet of the Apes, and <laughs> to to go back to that, uh, good old Chuck Heston. I actually saw Planet of the Apes with Charles Heston sitting in front of me at the Egyptian in Hollywood one time, which was awesome because <laughs> his grandson was asking him questions about like the sexuality in the movie. He's like, <laughs> "I'll tell you when we get home." <laughs> After he shows him his gun collection. Yes. And uh, so, but going back to Chuck Heston, Soylent Green. Mm. Soylent Green is people. Ah, and the sick. other 
the other uh, Kickstarter slash crowdfunding because there was no crowd no Kickstarter this week. Right, is Soylent, which is food for people that is not food. <laughs> it doesn't even taste like people, does it? It, it does not taste it, like you people. know. It tastes it of chicken. Like Ah, yeah. I I actually listened to a podcast with the guy who started this. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I should have looked that up. But he was asked by the podcast interviewees, like, why are you selling something that looks like a cup of semen? (laughs) (laughs) It it does not look good at all. (laughs) Well, to his credit, I think they've changed the picture on their website. To his credit, he said, yeah, that was Gen 1. We kind of fixed that. (laughs) So. Didn't work in the focus groups, I guess. No, no. Well, <laughs> oh. well. I mean, when you're I'm going, go. when you're starting with the name Soylent, you're not too worried about what people are going to think about your product. I'm thinking, right? <laughs> Either they're all like into it, and yeah. Then they look it up, and then they're like, oh, crap, you're, you're geeking out and you're into it, or or you just have no idea. Um, this, I love this, I love this is, idea though. I've always been kind of like, man, if somebody just made a pill and I just had to take that, I would take that like five days out of the week, and then I'd go eat on weekends or whatever. I might actually have to try this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not that expensive actually for yeah. what they what they, you know, propose, but the thing about it is everybody's different. So they're trying to come up with a universal food mm-hmm. that everybody can eat or drink because there's no chewing involved, which, you know, brings into other concerns about your jaw muscles yeah. atrophying and I mean there's there's a whole we eat for a reason, you know? <laughs> We're all going to look like Roger Ebert after like 10 years of drinking this crap. No <laughs> jaw bones and just like... Oh, 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 oh. Mm. But this might but be the perfect have, stuff to take to Mars. But they don't have food scientists on their team. You've got... If you look at the team, Rob Reinhardt, mm-hmm. who's the guy... Actually, that's the guy. He's a Y Combinator alum. Why do all these guys come out of Y Combinator? <laughs> um, this guy is a COO, industrial... This guy comes with a degree in industrial systems and engineering... Uh, sales and finance, uh, experience in operations and sales, communications. Nowhere on here is a single nutritional scientist. <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> right. Okay? Nowhere. They're, they're disruptive. That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're disrupting the industry by not knowing anything about it. Yeah, and what they're saying, what early adopters are saying, one guy says, as a bio- biologist slash chemist, I approve of Soylent, and I really want to start using it, but no name, right. no uh, no credentials. Mm-hmm. Oh, the taste is awesome. It, like a bunch of – this is like when you see a movie that's – you know, those two weeks out before they uh, release the movie, and you see all of the press clippings. Mm-hmm. If the names are really small and they're blipped by really fast and you can't read them, that's because it's from the Des Moines Herald and one <laughs> dude in the Midwest liked it. It's not from Rolling Stone. It's not from the Washington Post. So they've got the same thing going on with their quotes about what early adopters are saying. And there's literally no attribution to the right. to the. Quotes. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the hell's going on with this. Scott, would you would you drink this stuff? I try it. I would definitely but, try this for like a yeah, week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but how? Yeah, how long? What? What's your baseline well, yeah, for trying it? How long? We don't know, right? The whole idea. Do they have different flavors? I haven't really looked uh, into nope. it that much. Oh, no oh, really? Flavor. Soylent, Soylent flavor. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. <laughs> it could get monotonous, right? Right. It's uh, going to get monotonous. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I, even just doing like protein shakes, which I do, and I can get a variety of flavors. I get burned out by those real fast, but. Uh, I would do this for a week. I would totally try it and see what happened. But I totally, hey, but he, I'd want to get in the Matrix. They had to use a spoon. You know, <laughs> come on, this is just a this is a shake. You live on a shake, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have like a long shelf life. Is that the idea too? Right? I thought I remember. Oh, uh, they don't. I don't about, see anything about the oh, shelf okay. life. Maybe. Um, All right. So it's just efficient and inexpensive. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Right. It's. I mean, and honestly, I could probably go live off the shakes that I got at Target. <laughs> right now for probably a year without any ill effect yeah and and probably bulk up because they're mostly protein shakes for for muscle builders but yeah. i think this is an extreme end of it where we're working towards it other things with like the stem cell meat and stuff like that like i think there's other things this is like seems the the very end of it where you just have like one <laughs> thing right like <laughs> Yeah, this is it. It's like it's like it, this is funneling all food down into a shake. It's like okay, if I want a shake that I can eat every day, I'm going to go down to the awesome Mexican place down the corner, 
I'm going to get a steak burrito with extra sour cream and some horchata, <laughs> and I'm going to pour that into a blender, and that's Soylent for me. That's perfect. Got everything. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this being crowdfunded. But I again, like we've talked about this a hundred times. When you look at the list of people involved, and not a single one of them is like a biologist or a food specialist or anything. That's like how do the how do people just go ahead and and fund things without looking into it? It's it's a little scary to me. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Scott? Would you fund this? Mm. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I guess what is it? What do you get? I didn't look at the funding. Like, what do you get? Like, you get the first one of the first tastes of it or something? Is that well, for sixty-five <laughs> bucks you get a week. Seventy-five bucks. Oh, well, that's, that's like immediately committing to the program. Yeah, that seems like that's a it. bit. Much. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. okay. One hundred thirty yeah. bucks, two weeks, two. Th- it's, yeah. it's basically uh-huh. up to a month's supply. <laughs> I'll I'll go to the launch party and try some samples. How about that? And I'm I'm a little <laughs> bummed I don't get a T-shirt if I chip in an extra five bucks. <laughs> uh, or maybe they could sign the first package they send us. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. But the guy, the guy on the podcast said it will be FDA approved, which I don't know how they're going to uh, do that without uh, any food scientists on the on the roster. Know. That's crazy. Plus, that takes a while, as far as I know. It takes a couple of years, yeah. and they're 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 expecting delivery. They're estimating delivery between de- no December December this year is right. when they're estimating delivery. So how now, can you how, you can't get anything through FDA approval by December? Not unless they're already fast tracking it somehow. This is just one of those things. This and this is not this is not Kickstarter, by the way, because yeah. Kickstarter oh. kicked them out. They're like, <laughs> we don't we don't do supplements. We're not we're not in that racket. Yeah, you got to go somewhere else. And this is the first big one for a new crowdfunding app that is that will basically take you know. I want to shit on my grandmother's face for twenty bucks. Will you fund me? You know, <laughs> it's that it's that kind of lowbrow type of crap. It's yeah. so. still better than an iPhone case, though. No, <laughs> I did, that's that, that's my Kickstarter joke. I, we get so many Kickstarter <laughs> submissions, and it's always the uh, the best iPhone case ever. Like it's some sort of <laughs> you know, it's all there's so many of those that are just sort of like prototyping type things. So. So at least it's a little different. Yeah, but uh, I do like that Kickstarter actually stopped people from doing uh, photorealistic renderings of what their product <laughs> white, might look like in the future, oh, because God. it was confusing people. That they're like, oh, that's what I'm getting. They're like, no, no, no. We just made this in Photoshop. <laughs> this is kind of what it might look like. And they're like, oh, no, you got, you guys got to stop doing that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So, no, it's uh, I'm not buying it. All right, I'm not buying it. Wait, I'll, yeah, I'll wait on some reviews before I give it a shot. I'll wait till it gets to the Trader Joe's and then do that version. <laughs> <of> it. <laughs> It'll be like the little knockoff, but it'll kind of, you know. <laughs> what, what, they got Trader Jose for Mexican. Would be this? Uh, <laughs> what, 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 what would Soylent be? <laughs> Trader Marvin the Martian, of course. Trader Marvin's. Oh, Trader Marvin's. Okay, we'll go with Trader Marvin's. <laughs> <laughs> Trader Marvin's. So yeah, well that happened. <laughs> yes, we just had a, a major meltdown. I'm glad your computer at least came back up. Yeah, it took about ten minutes for it to uh, figure out that it wanted to boot again. <laughs> um, it uh, we lost power here in the wild woods of Pennsylvania <laughs> yet again. Right. But it's here's the thing: it's a sunny day. There's no <laughs> wind. There's nothing happening, and the power goes out. Yeah, for like thirty seconds and. <laughs> I I don't know if we lost, or at least if I lost all the recordings that I had, but I don't know. Everything is just <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> I think it. I think it was pissed at me because I I I let it secret out that time moves differently here. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. That it was right after you were discussing that. Um, we did kind of lose a segment, which is really interesting. Um, it's a bit of a bummer, but you know these things happen. Uh, thanks a lot, Scott, for coming on and for talking so long. And it was really interesting to hear you guys' stories. And maybe we can get them back on sometime soon, and, and we can finish that conversation that that uh, the lightning destroyed. <laughs> yeah. The, the, well, you know, <laughs> or what the they, lack they of were, anything destroyed. <laughs> here's the deal: they released the the, the location of Area 51, and then things start to go crazy. So <laughs> you saw that in the news. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So Area 51 is now uh, not an uh, not a thing. So Mulder is rolling over in his grave. <laughs> so. yeah. that, that just ruined all the sales of the X Files here for. Earth. So. Oh, yeah. oh man! God damn it! 
What? <laughs> you just cut out a little bit again. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I thought we lost you again. Oh. You still there? Oh, hang on. Hang you're, on. You know what it is? Yeah, I right, hang on. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Here's the deal. When you reboot your computer, mm-hmm. Dropbox tries to resync everything. <laughs> oh, okay. So we'll, you, we'll leave that you, in when, as a little tech tip for you folks. When you when you come back from a reboot, when you're on a on the middle of a fucking podcast, yeah, and you're on a Mac, don't press the button that says reboot everything and pause Dropbox. Jesus, fuck! What a <laughs> clusterfuck! God, everything was going so good. Yes. But I guess it really does kind of go back into that whole startup mentality when nothing works right and it's your job to fix it. Exactly. <laughs> God, I'm starting to sound like Stevie Nicks. My throat's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well, damn. there you go. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the conversation. Uh, again, thanks to Scott again. And uh, let's let's try to get him back on because you guys have a lot more to talk about and it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um... <laughs> And I really want I want you to jump in next time with some more stuff about what's going on with Silicon Beach, <laughs> and uh, or not going on. I or know I know a bunch on. of the guys down there, and it really is a different lifestyle because in all these places you can just walk to meet the founders of every other company, and down yeah. there you can't. No, you, you know? cannot. Yeah, it's a. Different I mean, thing. I know some of the guys down there, like Paige Craig, who's running some of the bigger stuff, and. Um, <clears throat> It's it's a weird vibe. That's always been the problem with LA. It's a weird vibe. Yeah, you know they don't have that that little petri dish mentality where everybody's stuck in the same few square miles. Yeah, agreed. It's a it's a completely different thing here, but uh, you know, we, it still works here too. It's just uh, it doesn't have that feeling of of community at all. So, well, it's LA. There is no community in <laughs> LA because everybody's out for themselves because they're a bunch of narcissistic fucks. And there's that. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I know that better than anybody. <laughs> so do you. It's all yes, good. I do. <laughs> so sorry about the technical difficulties at the end, there, folks. And uh, to be continued. Yeah. Well, next week we're going to finally finish this goddamn book. <laughs> yes, that is on because my on our list for next week. Next week, no guests, just us, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about all that stuff that we've been waiting to get to. Yeah, the I finished it today, and. Uh, I am dying to talk to you about it because I think it's it's definitely worthy of a good bit of discussion because he comes up with some good bit and this is the Who Owns the Future by Jared Larnier. Yep. I believe and uh I do believe. I do believe. I do believe and this is what I was listening to when I almost ran off the, <laughs> the rails on my tractor today. <laughs> I'm like, tell me about this future of everybody gets paid. Oh shit, brakes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is good stuff. So it'll be a good conversation that we'll be having next week. Yes, and thank you, everybody, for listening and uh, telling your friends. Please yes. tell your friends. Please tell your friends. Please. <laughs> Back me up, Brian. Please oh, tell your friends. tell your friends, please. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, finally. Uh, all right, Catch man. It. Hold there. Have, uh, a good, have a good one, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. We'll see you all next week. Keep up with the Grumpy Old Geeks on the web at grumpyoldgeeks.com. On Facebook at facebook.com slash grumpy old geeks or email them at podcast at grumpy old geeks.com. Have a good week. Okay, last one to kill a bad guy buys the beer. We're driving to Florida.